So what we're studying through these 40 days really comes out of John 10, 10. And I asked you to memorize John 10, 10, but I'm going to put it on the screen because I'm going to be, I'm going to be gracious to you. But I asked you to memorize John 10, 10. And if you memorize it, here's what we learned last week. Jesus says, I have come that you may have what life and you may have it abundantly. Jesus said, the whole reason I came is I came that you may have a life, that you may experience life, fullness of life, not, not just to survive. God doesn't want you to survive in life. God wants you to thrive in every area of your life. That's the will of God for you. That Jesus died and rose again so that you can experience the the life that he came, a life that is lived with God, a life that is consumed in God, a life that is prioritizing God, a life that is planted in the living God. He came to give you life. But it's in that word come that we offer the invitation. See, you have to come to him in order to experience the life that he's called you to experience. So what we learn in this whole series around this concept Following Jesus makes your life better. It gives you the opportunity to experience fullness of life, but also it makes you better at life. And I need this because sometimes I'm not very good at life. Anybody else? So, sometimes I think my way is the best way and ended up it's not the best way. It reminds me, Shane, remember this? There was a, a couple months back, something got in my iPhone. I don't know what it was, a virus or a demon. I don't know. But something got in my iPhone and um, I was trying to follow, you know, ways, this, this direction. And I was trying to get somewhere, and I plugged in the address, and I was going. And I was going down, and all of a sudden, the thing said, rerouting, make a U-turn. I'm on, I, and now I'm going down the interstate. I go, okay, I'm going to make a U-turn. So I make a U-turn. I'm going back the other way. All of a sudden, it says, rerouting, going the wrong way, make a U-turn. I'm literally doing laps, a lapse. And I'm going, this thing is messed up. It has no clue. Something was wrong in the compass of my iPhone that was directing me in the wrong way. And I feel that way in life sometimes. I feel that sometimes I think I'm going in the right way and all of a sudden it's rerouting. And I thought what would give me hope, what would give me joy, what would give me life? I get to that point, it says rerouting because it didn't fulfill me. This is why Jesus says I've come. That I've come to actually tell you, to give you the instructions of how you can actually live in fullness of life. Because you can keep doing it your way. You have full authority to keep doing it your way. But doing it your way, where's it going to lead you along the way? That's the question you have to answer. See, if Jesus loves you to the point he's willing to die for you, and he's infinite in his knowledge, he created life. He should know how life should be lived. And so he says, I want you to live in this life. And so he actually gives us characteristics. He actually begins to tell us what does it look like to live in the fullness of life. Now, he shares these things not so we would somehow gain a relationship with God. No, these come because we have a relationship with God. And so in Luke chapter 10, there's a story of a guy who comes up who's asking many times the same questions that we ask. God, how does it feel like I just keep going into dead end after dead end? How does it seem like it just seems like life is on repeat? God, how do I know I'm living in my divine destiny for purpose? God, I'm living for a life that matters. And so a guy came up, Luke chapter 10, and on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus and said, teacher, what must I do? And here's this question. What must I do? To inherit eternal life. Now him, to him, eternal life wasn't life that goes on and on and on. Eternal life was fullness of life, abundant life without measure. The life we so desire, that, that, that ache within us that wakes up every day and, know, and, and wants to know, and what I'm living for, is it worth living for? Does my life have meaning, purpose, and identity? Am I, really, am I really living in fullness of life or am I just breathing? And he's asking a real question to Jesus. His struggle is the same struggle. Nothing has changed in 2,000 years. I'm telling you, a lot has gone on in the world, but nothing has changed internally. We're asking this question. So we ask Jesus, what must I do? What must I do? And Jesus turns and says, what's written in the law? What does God tell you to do? He replied, "How, how how do you read it? And he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, congratulations, gold star. You answered correctly. Love God, love others. Love God, love others. Say it with me. Love God, love others. You've answered correctly, Jesus said. But then here's the impact. Here's where the impact is found. Do this, and you will live. Don't just agree with it. Actually do it. 
The only way you'll experience fulfillment in life is you have to love. He says, do this. Don't just write it up and say, okay, yeah, I'm going to strive towards this. He says, no, you actually got to make a decision and do it. That Jesus says, this is how you experience life. Don't don't miss the power, the impact of what he's getting at. The guy's going, how do I experience abundance of life? And Jesus says, well, how, how do you read the law? What does the word of God says? Love God, love others. And Jesus says, you're right. Now here's how you experience abundance. Live that out. Can we just testify that's hard? That's hard. And so skip to John 13, because it's going to be the text that I'm going to launch out of. And so Jesus knows how hard this is, and so he wants to give us understanding how we can live out this out, how we can actually live like this. So John 13 is, is, a, is a, a pinnacle passage. You've got to understand the background. It's called the upper room discourse, which means this is Jesus last 24 hours on earth. He's going to go. And after this, he's going to die. So he gathers his disciples together. He has one last meal. They call it the last supper. And he comes together and he wants to teach them. He says, these are my final instructions. And and guys, I don't want you to miss this. I don't want you to miss this. I mean, think about it. If you had just a couple hours and you had to summarize everything that you've done over the past three and a half years to somebody to make sure they wouldn't miss it, these would be the things to be like, okay, this is utter importance. So he looks at these guys and in John 13, 34, here's what he said. A new commandment. I give to you. And at this point, I think John, John, you know, who's writing this pulls out his pen. He's like, Ooh, this is going to be the 11th commandment. I mean, wow, this is like nothing has happened like this since Moses received the, you know, the 10 commandments on Mount Sinai. This is big. Jesus. Okay. Thou shalt what? Come on. I'm ready. I'm ready. Jesus. I'm ready. Jesus. He's ready to write. And she said, new commandment. I give to you that you love one another. I think John goes, Jesus, that's not new, right? We, we've been hearing that. We read that in the Old Testament. And Jesus, we, we, we've been with you over these three years. I mean, you've taught us love God, love others, love God, love others. I mean, it's commanded multiple times. Jesus, what do you mean? New commandment. And it's interesting because the word is the new. It's the new. It's the new. Shout new. new. Two, two different words Jesus could have used. One word in the Greek could be new in time. But that's not the word he used. He used the word new as a new way to see. Jesus says, I know you know how to love. I know you know the command to love, but now I'm going to give you a new way to see it. I'm going to give you a better way to love. Before this, you didn't understand the fully the way that God desires you to live in love. So I'm going to show you. I'm going to teach you how you're to live this out so you can live in fullness of life. Because remember, to not love is not experience life. Jesus, the essence of life is love. So how do I do that, Jesus? And Jesus, a new commandment to give you a new way. I'm going to give you a fresh perspective. Love one another. Okay, Jesus. Well, how? What does that look like? Just as I have loved you. This is what makes it new. I'm giving you fresh eyes to see this, a new lens. He says, just as I have loved you, now you also are to love one another. Jesus goes, hey, I don't want you to miss this. When you think about love, you think intention, you think emotion. But he says, that's not how I loved you. I didn't love you merely with a thought. I loved you with an action. I didn't merely love you because you were worthy of love. I loved you when you were unworthy of love. I loved you when no one else loved you. I loved you and I pursued you and I made a choice. I made a decision to love you and that's how I want you to begin to love other people. And Jesus said, this is the fresh way. If you could begin to see that love is an emotion anymore. No, no, no. Love is a decision. Love decides that love moves. Love is a decision where you begin to say, I'm going to make a choice. I don't feel like loving, but I'm going to choose to love. And I'm not going to do it merely by feeling. I'm going to do it by an action. When Jesus talked about love, every single time Jesus talked about love, he talked about a real choice that you and I had to make. And he says, just as I have loved you. Hey, Matthew, remember remember what you were doing before I ever met you? Yeah, you were a tax collector. And, And who wanted to be with you, Matthew? Nobody. No one wanted to be with you. But yet I crossed the road, Matthew. And I loved you. Nathaniel, remember, remember how I loved you? Remember when we first met? 
And I showed up and you dissed not only me, but you dissed my whole entire family. That you said, well, can anything good come from Nazareth? Remember that, Nathaniel? And Nathaniel, I think he's dropping his head like, yeah, I'm, yeah. And yet I didn't hold that against you, Nathaniel. I loved you. I loved you even when you criticized me. Hey, Peter. Hey, John. Hey, Andrew. Remember where I found you? You, you were doing what? You were fishermen. Yeah. Why were you fishermen? Because no one wanted you to do anything else. I mean, so you were just like, you were rele relegated to the lower confines of society and no one wanted to be around you because you smelled like fish all the time and you were just out there by yourselves. And yet, what did I do? I showed up and I said that through you, I'm going to work through you to change the whole entire world. I loved you with real action. And remember when all you guys wanted to leave me? And you were so scared and you were so mad, yet I kept loving you. And remember, remember James and John, when you got so mad at a city that you wanted to call down fire from heaven, you wanted to burn a city. You wanted to create genocide in a city. And yet I continue to love you even through the most horrible actions that you could possibly think of. That I loved you. And remember, remember when we saw all those people and they were hungry and all of you said, send them home. And I said, no, let's feed them. And I fed thousands because I loved them. And remember when you said, Jesus, stop healing people, but I didn't. I kept healing them because every time I saw someone hurting, I met a need and I healed. And he looks at his guys and he says, hey, that's how I want you to love. This isn't some vague emotional love. That's how I want you to love. Paul writes in Ephesians 5.1. He says, let's follow God's example. Well, how? Therefore, as dearly loved children. Okay, how am I supposed to live then? And walk, 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 shall walk. walk. Not think. Not, not imagine. Because I think we get really good at this, right? Well, I wish I would have said that, or I wish I would have done that. I wish I would have loved. If, if I just had more time, I would have. And we live with this belief, and we think the belief is good. And we think our intentions are good enough. And Jesus says, I'm not asking you to intend it. I'm asking you to actually walk in it. Walk in the way of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering, as a sacrifice to God. He says, I want you to love like this. This is how I want you to love. One of the questions that has transformed my life, it's a question that has moved me and changed me and transformed me. It's a question I repeat to myself over and over again. When I'm in a situation and I don't know what to do, when I'm in a situation where someone has hurt me, when I'm in a situation where I walk into a room and I'm looking at all the people in the room and I just want to run, when I'm in a situation where I feel stressed out or I'm in a situation where even where I feel like life is great, there's one question that gives me incredible clarity to live this out. It's the most simplest question. What would love do? That one question, if you will start asking yourself that one question, it will change your life. Then when you don't know what to do, if you would just pause long enough to ask, what would love do in this situation? It gives you clarity. It gives you the opportunity to look past the emotion and the attentions and all the things that you have. Well, I wish I could do that. And gives you actual concrete clarity, practical realities of how to live life out to the fullest. Just that simple question. What would love do? You're in a one-on-one -on -one with your teacher because you can't stand the teacher who's teaching your kid. And you're going, okay, what do I do? What do I do? Here's what you do. Before you go into the parent-teacher conference, you ask the question, what would love do? When your neighbor, whose dog barks all through the night, and you pray, God, smite that dog, please, before you run off and knock on your neighbor's door, here's what you need to ask. What would love do? When somebody gets the promotion and you don't get the promotion that you wanted, what would happen if you paused long enough to ask, what would love do? When you see somebody's hurting, but you look at your time and you go, just don't got time. What would happen if you paused long enough to just ask that question? What would love do? This is what allows us to experience the fullness of life. This one question changes everything. 
It will change every relationship, every marriage, everything that you come in contact with. What would love do? Because sometimes love means that you need to say what no one else wants to say. Sometimes love presents people with grace and sometimes love presents people with truth. Some of you, you've needed to have hard conversations. But you're afraid of hard conversations because you haven't asked this question, what would love do? Sometimes love means that I'm going to get up in some business of somebody else and say, hey, I love you too much to keep allowing you to destroy you. And sometimes love comes alongside them and says, hey, I'm not going to bail you out of jail again. And sometimes love comes alongside and says, hey, I'm willing to buy your groceries. It's a question that allows you in that moment to say, God, I need wisdom. How do I love like this? And just pause long enough and just ask God, God, give me the wisdom to ask what would love do and then show me the answer, God. It's when you see a need, you meet a need. You don't just think about how to meet it. You meet it. Walk in the way of love. So Jesus turns to his followers and says, here's, here's what I want you to do. Just as I loved you, love one another. Now, don't go. Some of you guys are like, oh, he's gone all woke on me. He's all, you know, he's all this, you know, out here and all touchy feeling, all that. That's just not me. Okay, bro, just let me, let me present you with this reality. This is a 33-year-old man who's saying this, who in the next 24 hours, who has all the power and all the authority and all the strength to do whatever he wants to do, yet he lays it all aside and goes in to punch the devil in the face for you because he loves you too much for you to spend eternity in hell. That's not mushy. That's power. That's my Jesus. See, that's love. Don't let culture to define love. Let's define to culture what love really is. Let's define it by Jesus Christ. He loved, so I'm going to love like that. And so we come forward. He says, I want you to love with an action. Love moves. Love moves. Shout, love moves. It's really the hallmark of who we are at Journey Church. Love moves. But why is it so important that we do this? Look what he says. This is so big. This is so big. What he says next. He says, the reason why you need to do this, verse 35, by this, by what? Love. By this, all people, all people will know. They're, they're going to know something. They're going to see something in you that they wouldn't know otherwise. They're going to know that you are my disciple if you do what? If you have love one for another. Now, for a long time, I just thought this was saying, okay, if we love, it just identifies me as a disciple. But, but I think Jesus would get into something deeper here, deeper, deeper, deeper. Can I go a little deep with you? So think about the context. The context is he about to leave. And the disciples are going, Jesus, if you leave, who's going to fill in the space? Jesus, if you leave, who's going to love the people? Jesus, if you leave, who's going to bring healing? Jesus, if you leave, who's going to bring hope to the world? Jesus, if you leave, who's going to be your hands? Who's going to be your feet? Jesus, if you leave, who's going to go to the broken and the hurting? Who, Jesus? And Jesus looks at them and says, I want you to understand something. By this, all people will know. They will know. What will they know? They will not only know that you follow me, but they will know what it means to follow me, and they'll know the one who you are following. He says, by your love, what people begin to see is they will actually begin to see my love through you. The reason that the devil will hit you so hard not to live with love is because they knows that love has a power. That when you love, you unleash the power of God in whatever situation you enter into. And so if you want to love the better way, Jesus, you got to realize that God moves through your love. That God actually has ordained it, that God has established it, that God begins to move with power through your love. Every time you decide that you're going to love, every single time where you say, I'm not going to do what I want, I'm going to do what love wants. Every time you do that, you create an opportunity for the spiritual, supernatural, infinite power of the living God to step into a situation to transform it and change it. I mean, just think about it in your life. Who's had the greatest impact in your life? People who've nagged you? People who've threatened you? Who's had the greatest impact in your life? Who do you look back? When you look back over your life and you go, wow. Man, they changed me. It was not the people who were against you. It wasn't the people who nagged you. It was the people who loved you. You see, our, our world says love has power. It does have power. 
And the reason it has power is because when we love in and through Jesus Christ, it actually creates the opportunity for God to begin to move through the way that we love. Jesus, I'm about to go and I'm about to leave, but I'm going to leave you with my love. And by your loving, people will know how to begin to follow me. This is why the devil's going to do everything he can in your life to keep you from loving. Because he knows if he can keep you from loving, he's going to keep the power of God flowing through you. But if you begin to love, he knows that you become a powerful weapon for the kingdom of God, that you can push back darkness, that you can do the impossible, that God's hand of anointing is upon you, that you're going to live a life of destiny and purpose because you begin to say, I already know what to do. I'm going to love, I'm going to love, I'm going to love. And when I love God, that's when you make the difference. That's when you push back darkness. That's how I know that I live in my anointing. To live in fulfillment means that you live with love because love is what creates the opportunity. Every time you love, every time, God supernaturally works in incredible ways to reveal himself through your love. It's powerful. It's powerful. There was a, a lady who, she went to her school. She was a single mom. And she says, I'm, I'm struggling, I'm struggling, I'm struggling. She went to the school and the school said, um, we can't help you, but I love this. Here's what happened. This is why I love my church. They said, we can't help you, but there's a church called Journey Church. And they love people and they love to help people. Why don't you give them a call and see if they can help? The single mom called. We were able to love her. We were able to help her. She started coming to our services. As she came to our services, she understood the love of Jesus Christ and why we love the way we love. She gave her life to Jesus Christ, and now she's serving other people, beginning to part of the process to make a difference in someone's life. The early church had no power in and of themselves. They had no money. They were not involved believing in politics to change the world. They didn't have clout. They didn't have authority. But they had love. And through the way they loved, they overcame the Roman Empire without firing a shot. Through the love that they showed, they transformed the whole entire of the world without a war ever happening. That's the power of what happens when you and I begin to live in the mandate of love. That's why you will be attacked the most in this area, because you will be impotent without love. You will never live in your purpose without it. If we would just start here, this is how we experience power. This is how you open your life up to experience what God wants to do in your life. You begin to say, what would love do? And you begin to do it. And when you do, you push back the very darkness. This is why God planted you. This is why God supernaturally ordained for you to be in the situations you're in. I know you look at your situation and you go, I got a crazy family. Anybody have a crazy family? I got a crazy family. And sometimes you wonder, why in the world am I in this crazy family? All they do is get on my nerves, get on my nerves, get on my nerves. Why am I in this crazy family? And God says, because I put you in that crazy family, because one, you were crazy. <laughs> but maybe the way that your whole family is going to be changed is before they ever listen to a voice like mine, they're going to listen to a voice like yours if you would just love the people in your own family. Maybe there's a reason why God still has you in the job that you're at. Maybe because through your love in that job that you're at that you hate, maybe that's the very place that God is going to create a revival through the way that you love. Maybe the reason you live in the neighborhoods you live in is not by accident. You know, scripture says that God ordains the very places where our tents dwell, which means he establishes the boundaries of where we live. And God says, I put you in that neighborhood because I want you to love the people in your neighborhood because by your love, you're going to be the light and you're going to transform that neighborhood. That's why you're there. You're not where you're at by accident. You're there by divine, supernatural prerogative of the living God who divinely established you, anointed you, equipped you with power to bring the transformation that he's been desiring to the places where he's planted you. If you would just love and love and love and love because love has power hour when love begins to move. That's why you're at the places you're at. What would love do? It would change everything. 
And so Jesus says, this is why I'm asking you to do it. But how, Jesus? I mean, this seems... Anybody else struggle doing this? Let's just be real. I struggle with this. Some people are easy to love, right? And some people I just want to punch in the face. Don't don't look at me all crazy and funk-eyed. I mean, I need the real people. Don't, Don't you religious, pious people. I'm talking about real people. Some people are just hard to love. Some people just get under your nerves, don't they? They just, ugh, ugh, ugh. How, how, do I, how do I love them? The emphasis is in verse 34. I want you to look out for the focus. Look at the focus. Look at the focus. Verse 34, look what Jesus says. Just as I have loved you, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. No, notice the power of the context of focus. He's, 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 he purposely said what he said in a way that he said it because he wants you to understand the highlight, the focus. What are you to focus on? Because what you focus on will determine whether you can really love. If you focus on the latter half, well, I just got to love one another, love one another. You're going to miss it. The reason he said it the way he said it was not to give you an example. The reason he said it because he understood that his love has power. And he says, if you would just begin to understand, I have loved you. If you understand just how I have loved you, I've loved you, I've loved you, I've loved you. If you understand the power in which I've loved you, that's what's going to empower you to actually love like I'm telling you to love. See, I'm not sending you out. I'm not sending you out and telling you just to love one another. I'm sending you out because I'm going to give you the power to love. And the power to love will come by you focusing on my love, not your love. If you're going to live in the better way of love, Jesus says, you have to allow Jesus' love to move through you. You can't just allow Jesus' love to stay in your head. You have to allow the love of Jesus to begin to transform your heart, your mind, your essence of who you are. You have to allow the love of Jesus to so consume you. This is what gives you the power to do it. See, when Jesus talks about, I love you, he's not just giving you an example. He's not just saying, hey, I want you to love like this. He's actually giving you the source that allow you to love like this. I'll give you an example from my own life. For a long time, I would hear this word, love one another, love one another, love one another. And then I meet people that were hard to love. And so then I'd feel guilty. Well, I'm just not loving people. You know, I could have gave something to that guy with the sign on the street. I didn't love him. And the evil one just starts reminding me of all the people I should have loved that I didn't love. And he just starts barking and speaking and overwhelming me. Then I'm, I'm, I'm consumed with condemnation. And I go, well, I'm a failure. So I'll tell you what I'll do, God. I will love other people better. I will love harder and stronger. And God, I will love, I will love, I love. And I get like on the treadmill, you know, the, and I just crank it up. I'm going to love even faster, God. You know, I was at level 20. Now I'm going to be at level 30. God, I'm going to love. And I just start, whoo, whoo, you know, boom, boom, and Rocky playing in my mind. You know, I'm going to love, I'm going to love, I'm going to love, I'm going to love. But then it gets harder and harder and harder and harder and harder. And I fail. I go, okay, I'll do it again. I need to be more loving. All right, I'm going to love, 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 I'm going to love. And I get up and I start running again. I'm going to love, I'm going to love, I'm love. But then I fail. And finally, I got to the point I said, I can't do it. God, I can't do it. I I wish I was more loving. I wish I was more generous. God, I... I want it, but God, I can't. I'm struggling, God. I'm struggling to love. I'm struggling to love. And the Holy Spirit just began to speak. It's because you're focusing on your own love. James, you can't give what you haven't received. This is about to set some of you free. The reason you struggle to love is because you haven't fully received the love that he wants to pour out into your heart. What's going to give you the ability to love is you have to stop focusing on your love. Because you ain't got it. You ain't got it. But when I begin to feast upon his love, when I begin to get my eyes fixed off of what I need to do and already on what he's done for me, 
when I realized he loved me, he loved me, he loved me. That was the emphasis Jesus was trying to get him to see. Hey guys, I'm about to show you the height, the width, the depth of my love for you. I'm willing to die for you and then rise again for you. I love you and there's nothing you can do to make me love you less and there's nothing you can do to make me love you more because I love you. When you get that, it, it empowers you and his love begins to now work through you. This is how John wrote, 1 John 4.10. This is how John wrote it. John says, here's what I learned about love. This is love. What's love, John? Not that we love God. See, some of you think, well, the more, the more that I love God, the more that he loves me. And John says, that's not love. That's religion. Religion will tell you what to do, but doesn't have the power to do it because it's not motivated by the power of the living God and the love that he lavished upon you. So he says, this is love. Not that, lo not that we love God, but that he loved us. He loved us. Well, how do I know that he loved us? Because he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for my sins. You see, I don't love God. So I can say, okay, God, I'm going to love you more so you'll forgive me more. He says, no, I already forgave you through Jesus Christ. Either you accept it or you reject it. The moment you receive it, I love you. Your sins are forgiven. The moment you receive Jesus Christ, this is what's so amazing, incredible about the faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus says, I already did all the work for you. You don't have to do any more work. When Jesus cried out on the cross, it is finished. It means it's completed. Everything that you possibly needed to have a right relationship with the living God, for God to lavish his love upon you, has already been accomplished in and through Jesus Christ. You either receive it or deny it. You don't have to earn it. But as soon as I receive it, I realize I am loved. 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 I'm loved. You're loved. I don't know who needs to hear this. I believe the spirit of, I can feel the spirit. You are loved. You. Now I'm not talking to anybody else. No, no, you, 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 you are loved. You are loved. Push somebody right now. Say you are loved. Put it in the chat. You are loved. And so John says, because you're loved, look what he says now, verse 11. Now he's ready to give, give the emphasis. Now he's ready to give the action. You see, we, we can't, we can't. We can't walk in the way until we understand how to walk in the way. So I don't walk in the way in order to earn God's love. I walk in the way of love because I am loved. You catch the difference? And so John says, now you're ready to understand it. And so he gets to verse 11. He says, so dear friends, since God so loved us. I love he said so loved us. Have you ever been in so love with somebody? I've been in so love with I remember I was so loved, so loved. I remember when I got so loved with my wife. We could talk for hours and it felt like minutes. I remember when I saw my kids for the first time, I was so loved my kids. They did nothing for me. All they did is just pee in my face and have to, <laughs> have to wipe them after a bowel movement. That's love. I'm telling you, right? And yet I love them. I so loved them. I so loved them. I so loved them. I so loved them. I loved them. Do you realize when God looks at you and says, I so love them? Oh, I so love them. 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 I know they failed. I so love them. I know they're an addiction. I so love them. I know they're struggling. I so love them. I know they failed again. I so love them. I know they failed again. I so love them. I know they blew it again. I so love them. I know they blew it for the thousand times. I so love them. Nothing can stop my love for them. I so love them. I so love them. I so love them. I dealt with the consequence of their sin on the cross. I so love them. So, dear friends, since God so loved us, we also, we also ought to love one another. Now, ought is not an obligation. Ought is an opportunity. 
that John is saying, you've been divinely empowered by the living God to love. You see, his love is moving through. You don't got to force it. If you're struggling to love some hard to love people, if you're struggling, don't focus on them. They will not give you reason to love them. Right? They'll just get reason to get more mad at them. If I look at myself and I go, well, I need to love them. I need to love them. I'm going to feel like a failure because I don't have the power to do it. But he's given us a better way. Oh, can you see it? He's given me a better way. You see, what happens, though, when I focus on his love, and I remember all the times when I blew it and he still forgave me, and all the times when I ran from him, but he ran towards me, and times where I needed something, he met it even though I didn't deserve it, the time when he crossed the line and came for me and pursued me, and he loved me, and he said, I so love you, I so love you, I so love you. The more that I concentrate on Christ dying on the cross for me, and when I see his blood being shed for me, when I see the nails put into his hands for me, when I see the scars upon him that he bears for me, when I see all that, and I go, what manner of love is this what love is this what love is this that the king of glory should die for me who am i that you should give your life for my life why 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 jesus why and his answer is because i so love you when you see that something stirs within you and you have the power now that you begin if you so love me like that then I will so love them even when I don't feel like it even when I don't understand it even when I don't like it I'm gonna love because I first was love and in that love I have love and in your love I have purpose in your love I have my destiny in love I have my power because I am love beyond imagination that's why John says you gotta get this verse 19 we love because He first loved us. The reason you struggle to give love is maybe you've never rested in the fact you're already loved. You see, you can't give what you haven't received. You can't be empowered by what you haven't experienced. Jesus says, I want you to love, but you can't do it. But focus on me and my love for you. And my love for you will do what the law could not do. This is why it's a new commandment. Because this command actually has the power to empower you to do what you can't do on your own. You are loved. Will you pray with me all of our locations? Will you pray, God, I receive it. God, I receive your love. If you've never received the love of Jesus Christ right now, I'm going to give you an opportunity. It's just with a prayer. And so right now in your heart, you don't even have to verbalize it. You can just speak it. God hears your heart. Will you just say, dear Jesus, thank you that you died on a cross for me. Thank you that you so loved me that you gave your life for me. Thank you that you so loved me that you sacrificed so that my sins can be forgiven. Jesus, I receive your love because God, I, for many of you, you don't even love yourself. And the reason you don't love yourself is because you don't know how much you've been loved by the living God. And so would you receive it? Say, God, I receive this love that comes in and through Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, would you make this love so real within people's lives? God, I pray that you would let them understand they're so, 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 so loved. God, I pray that you would break down every barrier. God, I pray that you would open their eyes. I I pray that you would let the cross become supreme in their affections. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would take the death of Christ Jesus and his death and his burial and his resurrection and make it come alive to let them realize they're so loved that you sent your one and only son to die for them so their sins can be forgiven. Holy Spirit, would you make it fresh upon them? Because what our world needs is love. And God, we can't love. We can't love in our own power. We can only love in the power that is found in Jesus Christ. 
And so, God, I receive it right now. I receive it right now. I receive it right now. I receive your love. I receive your forgiveness. I receive it. I can't earn it. I receive it. I receive it. I receive it. I am so loved. I thank you, Jesus, that you love me. You love me at my best, and you love me at my worst. You love me in my addiction and in my freedom. You love me on the mountain, and you love me in the valley. You love me, and there's never been a season in my life where you haven't loved me. You love me, and you love me, and you love me. You so love me that you gave your son for me. You so love me love me that you ordained the steps in front of me. You so love me that you put purpose in my heart. You so love me that you gave me your spirit that raised Christ from the dead. You so love me. And God, my mouth will never stop thanking you. My heart will never stop expressing. Come on, stand to your feet. You begin to say, God, I receive it and I give it. God, I want to praise you. Just tell him right now, God, I want to praise you. You are good and you are faithful. God, I want to thank you that I don't deserve this love. God, I've never deserved it, but I come to shout and praise you because you gave it to me freely. I come by faith alone. I come by grace alone. I come by the power of Jesus Christ. I am loved beyond imagination. I'm loved in my best of days and I love in my worst of days. I receive it by faith. I receive it. I am loved. I am loved. I am loved. And so God, I will shout for the glory of your name because you are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy. And so I'll give you praise because you are worthy.